zero research, so I'm, I'm glad that she took care of that already. My father became addicted to crack cocaine, and when I was two years old, he abandoned our family for about six years. Kicked out of our home in San Diego, my mother, brother, and I moved into a small two-bedroom house in San Bernardino, California. We had no central heating, and on cold nights, my brother and I would stand in front of the wall heater and take turns to try to get warm. I remember my mother spraying for roaches, setting mouse traps, and rescuing me from the slugs that would occasionally creep up the bathtub drain. And though there were many joyful moments in my childhood, I knew that I wanted a different life. And I knew that I wanted the remote to work. <laughs> Why don't you turn to your neighbor and ask them how they're feeling about what they've learned so far from Mary? <laughs> Where did I leave off to? I think I was saying, although I had many joyful moments in life, I knew that I wanted something different. And I... I went to the library, there was a library called the Dorothy Ingram Library, and they had a reading program where if a child read five books, they could get a coupon for a hamburger from McDonald's. So initially I read to eat, but eventually I read to escape. Books became my refuge, a temporary reprieve from my chaotic life. I loved reading about the antics of Amelia Bedelia, Ramona Quimby's chief parent household, and Margaret's daily practice of writing to God because she just needed someone to talk to. A voracious reader, I would spend hours in my room, and when I came up for air, I wanted a pig like Wilbur, a horse like Black Beauty, and a complete family like Josephine March and Little Women. As my love for reading transitioned into a love of learning, I was fortunate to have many teachers who helped me along my journey. In fifth grade, Mrs. Landry showed surprise when I, one of her only black students, misbehaved for the first time because she had high expectations for all of the, her students, no matter what race they were. In seventh grade, Mrs. Miller reprimanded me when I used improper grammar to impress a boy because she knew that wasn't how I normally talked. And in eighth grade, Mrs. Alps looked me in the eyes and said, Michelle, you're a writer. In 11th grade, when the kids were teasing me for doing my homework, Mr. Skidmore said, they're laughing at you today, but they'll be pumping your gas tomorrow. And it wasn't all of my teachers, but there were enough teachers who saw me and saw something in me that they wanted to nurture and develop. And that simple act of being seen made me feel like I mattered, like I was important. And I wanted to make sure that I did that for students when I became a teacher at the High Tech High organization. So the High Tech High organization is a network of 13 public charter schools. We have four elementary schools, four middle schools, and five high schools. We also have the nation's first graduate school of education that's situated within a K-12 learning environment. And we operate under four design principles. The first design principle is personalization. So this really means that we care a lot about developing relationships with our students. We really want to foster an environment of trust and security with them. And we do that in a number of ways. We have really small schools, small class sizes, and we have something called advisory where we get to stay with the same student for four years. And that's when I met Laylee. Every advisor conducts a home visit for an incoming ninth grade student. And when I went to Laylee's house, that's how I got to know her family. I was able to see where she lives, so I just know where she's coming from. And through advisory in our time together, we of course play games, we have advice circles, we visit universities, we do community service together, but it's also a time for me to really get to know my students deeply. That's how I learned that Laylee's parents were having a custody battle that had caused her to miss school. It's how I learned that her struggles with cerebral palsy and her medical complications were also an inhibition. 
And it's also how I found out that there were students who were bullying her about her physical disability. So that's why advisory became a place where I could actually help build up her self-esteem, give her leadership roles, and let her know that there was an adult who really cared about her growth and development. So this personalization and this ability to get to know our students well really serves as a way to connect. And that's probably the reason why I was one of the first people that Lately called when she got into Stanford and Yale and Harvard. And so when we think about personalization in our own context, it's really important to think about what are ways that we can do that wherever you're at. Our second design principle is authentic work. So this means that teachers are teaching to their passions and students are doing work that matters so that we avoid having what Mary described as these years of schooling without any real learning taking place. But with authentic work, students have that opportunity to do really important work. So we'll look at a project that we did with the elderly. My students were learning about how the elderly were treated in different countries. And that's how they learned about China's elderly rights law. And they also learned about some of the horrific ways the elderly are treated in the United States. So we were reading a book called Tuesdays with Story, well, Tuesdays with Maury, which is a book about um, a professor and the relationship that he has with a student. And then my students did a project called Tuesdays with Story. Do you remember the book titled Tuesdays with Maury? In it, a journalist makes weekly visits to his former college professor to learn the meaning of life. Well, now one Southern California teacher has taken that concept to the high school classroom. As Vicki Vargas reports, the program is called Tuesdays with Story. How come with that? She uses words like empathy and critical thinking. So this is our last day of filming. Then Michelle Sadrina Clark lets her U.S. history and American literature class loose. Let's go. Every Tuesday for a month, these students from San Marcos High Tech High walk one block to the Brookdale Retirement Home. Human beings are the most dynamic textbooks, and I think that students can learn so much more by having this personal connection of someone who lived through the history than simply reading about it. It is a different kind of classroom. How did that song go? Because yeah, I'm not familiar with songs. Of Younger than springtime, are you? And that's what we were we were younger. And what they learn is that everyone has a story to tell. When you're a foster child, you're afraid because you don't have a home. It's evident 86-year-old Pat Livingston is connecting with Lucas and Nicholas, doling out wisdom. Losing youth is uh, and honesty. I can't do the computer. I'm not a genius. But the project goes even further. The students are sketching portraits and making memory boxes for their Brookdale buddies and taking a little artistic license. So I'm planning on doing a more colorful kind of work on his facial features just to show how youthful person he is on the inside. Using the Navy, so I'm going to burn the Navy um, seal on the top, and then there's going to be an anchor over it right here. One of the lessons the students are learning is the lesson of time. And when they spend time on these projects, they say somehow they begin to feel closer to their buddy. The students hope whatever time has erased will come back in some way brighter and more colorful when they present this artwork to their buddies in January. I'm impressed with their interest, uh, the questions they ask. Tom Dries believes his sessions with teenagers 70 years his junior are having an impact. Morgan has, has told my stories back to me a couple of times, so I, I, I've made some impression on him. This high school junior now realizes Dries faced the same challenges when he was her age. How teachers have helped him very with me was in school and how I'm getting that help now. So that really helped me to connect with them a little more. So I try to design projects that have a human connection with people that are outside of the student's normal comfort zone. This time, the goal and the hope is that these generations stay connected even after the camera is turned off. In San Marcos, Vicki Vargas, NBC4 News. So what was great about that project too is that when the students were interviewing their elderly person about different chapters of their life, about their romance years, their different marriages, their first loves, the war years, the depression, we made those into DVDs that we actually gifted to the elderly because many of them, some have already passed on um, since then, and so now their families have this DVD of them talking about their lives and they have this portrait that the students um, made. So 
It was a beautiful project. Our third design principle is collaborative design. So this means that teachers are working together to design curriculum and design projects, and oftentimes we include the input of the students. So with this particular project, we were studying the 1920s, and the students were reading The Great Gatsby, and they were reading Zora Neale Hurston's Sweat, and we were really focusing on the Harlem Renaissance, which really celebrates the advancements of African American people during the 1920s. And the students decided to create a speakeasy, which is kind of an underground nightclub that used to take place in the 1920s. And they self-selected into different design teams. And so there was one group that was the ambiance group. They researched all of the Harlem Renaissance artists, and then they painted replications of those art pieces and decorated the speakeasy. We were getting ready for this all school exhibition when hundreds and hundreds of community members come to see the students talk about their work. So every class, every grade, they're all on display that night. And so um, they wanted to make sure that when people walked in, they stepped back into time and felt like they were in the 1920s. We also had the jazz group. So these students researched Harlem Renaissance jazz artists. They obtained the sheet music, they taught themselves the songs, rehearsed, and then they were our musical entertainment for the evening. Our poets researched all the Harlem Renaissance poets and they studied their poetry and the night of the exhibition, they performed the original poem and then they also performed their own modern day adaptations of that poem. The gaming group worked with the math teacher because they were studying probability and statistics and we like to do projects together with different teachers. So they basically altered the odds of the game so that they could win more money from the parents when they came to play during the casino night. And then, of course, the security group, they studied prohibition and the rise of criminals during the 1920s and the government response. And about 20 minutes into the exhibition, they staged a raid where there was a fight between criminals and police officers. And then they arrested all of the parents because it's illegal to be at a speakeasy. And they would arrest the parents and usher them out of the room. And this was our clever way of getting one group of parents out so that we could let another group of parents in because it was one of the most popular exhibitions that night. And the students still talk about this exhibition because the teachers got involved, we sang, and the reason why they loved it is because they were a part of every decision that we made for this project. Our final design principle is equity. We are an equity project. We are very intentional about making sure that our schools are integrated and diverse and that the students that we serve are representative of the community. For this reason, we use a zip code based lottery so that we can make sure we have diverse students. We also don't believe in tracking. So all of our students, regardless of their ability level, are in the same classroom. And it's the teacher's responsibility to accommodate and differentiate to support all students as they develop their full potential. As important as we think equity is, is within our school, we also support and promote equity and social justice outside of school. So this project um, was called the Responsibility, Empathy, and Action Project, and students worked with the peacemakers from the International Rescue Committee, and these were high school-aged refugee students who were living in San Diego County. There were Sudanese, Burmese, Chaldean, and Iraqi students. And they came to our school and my students interviewed them about their experience, why they had to leave their home country, what um, struggles they endured, and how they were treated here in the, or there in the United States. And they also took their photographs and they worked with the art teacher to paint their portraits. And they also painted really artistic, inspirational pieces and wrote spoken word poetry that was inspired by the lives of the refugees they interviewed. And this all culminated in an arts and poetry festival. And with this particular festival, I contacted a gallery owner in San Diego, and he was the son of immigrants. He really loved the project, so he let us have the entire gallery for free. So the students worked tirelessly to curate the art because they were gonna have a silent auction. They actually set up spaces where they could talk about the refugee memoirs that they had been reading and talk about more current refugee statistics. They also served food, they played music, and what was so great is that the refugee students shared their testimony about um, how far they've come and, and, and what they had to celebrate, and then my students performed their spoken word poetry. And by the end of the night, people were just crying, it was just so loving, and all of the money that we raised from selling the art, we gave back to the Peacemakers program, which gives scholarships to those refugee students. 
And so I think for this particular um, project, what students found really powerful is that they were doing something with someone else, but also for someone else. And a lot of the students actually asked their parents to buy the paintings and then they would gift them to the refugee students so that they could take them back home to their families. So it was just a beautiful example of what empathy in action actually looks like. So as you think about your own context and you think about what design principles are guiding your work, I mean, we all are in different communities, but there's something, there's some principles that are designed, that are guiding our work. So think about what that might be for you. And think about how you can design projects and curriculum that actually line up with those principles that you want students to walk away with. Because I think you'll find that when you really integrate principles and meaningful projects, then you have a situation where we're really designing progress for not only our students, but for our community, and I would argue for our whole world. And I just want to thank Teddy and her team for the work that they're doing to make this happen all over. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. You know what? Every time I hear 